Hello and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Building Farm to Institution Markets a webinar and survey launch to help Minnesota farmers grow. My name is Pete Huff and I'm the Director of Food Systems at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy and I'll be facilitating the webinar today. We're going to feature three great presenters that are going to give you a little bit of insight on farm to institution, um, particularly from the producer perspective. Um, we'll have Ryan Pesch from the University of Minnesota Extension, Greg Richards from Riverbend Farm, and Andrea Northrup from Minneapolis Public Schools. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, quite a few people on the webinar today. The number keeps growing with every minute here. Um, and uh, at the moment we have uh, around 50 people that are joining us and hopefully more. Um, which will hopefully make for a really great Q&A discussion at the end of the presentation. So as you listen, think of your questions. You have an opportunity to share them, and I'll tell you how to do that here in a, in a moment. Um, this webinar, um, in particular, is the launch of a, uh, of a producer survey on farm to institution that was developed in partnership by the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, the Sustainable Farming Association, and, the Renew and Renewing the Countryside, along with input from over 20 farms uh, state agencies, experts, and nonprofit organizations. Um, so it's been a truly collaborative effort. So the webinar is helping us kick that off so that we can get some input from producers on farm to institution. Um, it's, um, it's for Minnesota producers, whether they have experience with farm to institution or not. Um, so if, you're, if you fall into that category of growing food within the state um, and have the interest, you can find the survey um, for, uh, that I just mentioned at the link at the bottom of the screen. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on down the line. So for those of you um, that uh, might, not, might not be familiar with webinars, I wanted to familiarize you with how to best participate in the webinar. So at the moment, all the audience members are currently muted, um, but we still want to hear your voice. If you have technical questions about the webinars, like you're having trouble with your audio or aren't sure how to um, access a certain feature, um, or you have a question for one of our presenters, you should use the question box that's located on your webinar control panel. There's a number of different options in that control panel, so feel free to explore. Um, the questions that you ask will go directly to Catherine, our webinar guru, who's sitting at the other end, and she should be able to help you out with anything uh, that might be troubling you. Um, you do also have the option to call in via telephone if for some reason your computer is not playing ball with you right now and you'd like to uh, try a different option. You can choose the telephone option in the audio section of your control panel. Again, if there's any technical problems, uh, use the question box to go to Catherine. Finally, we are recording this webinar and it will be available shortly after its conclusion. You can find that on the IATP website via the link that is listed. That's IATP.org forward slash video. So enough of the housekeeping there. Um, just wanted to move on to give you a little bit of background for those of you who aren't familiar. I wanted to share a bit about the partner organizations that developed this webinar and the producer survey that it's helping to launch. The Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy um, works locally and globally at the intersection of policy and practice to ensure fair and sustainable food, farm, and trade systems. You can learn more about this organization at the website there, iatp.org. The Sustainable Farming Association supports the development and enhancement of sustainable farming systems throughout, throughout, through farmer-to-farmer -farmer networking, innovation, demonstration, and education. And again, you can check out uh, all of SFA's great work at their website there, sfa-mn.org. Finally, Renewing the Countryside is working for a more just, vibrant, and sustainable rural America by championing and supporting communities, farmers, artists, and entrepreneurs who are revitalizing the countryside through innovative initiatives. To learn more about Renewing the Countryside at renewingthecountryside.org. So check out all those websites if you'd like a little bit more information on this project as well as other topics related to agriculture, rural community, and food. And thanks to both SFA and Renewing the Countryside for, um, for partnering and working on this project with us at IATP. So as I mentioned, uh, this webinar is the launch of a comprehensive survey of Minnesota producers on the topic of farm to institution. Um, as I mentioned as well, we've worked with a lot of different organizations throughout the state to put together one survey that addresses a lot of issues that are associated with farm to institution. And now I'll go into a little bit more about what farm to institution is in the coming slides. This project itself, though, has been built off a lot of great work from a lot of other individuals and organizations, and we have a lot of appreciation for uh, many of the folks that have continued to do hard work um, connecting good food to our various schools and other public institutions. The goal of our survey is to listen to producers first on what they think is needed to expand 
the farm to institution market into one that is easily accessible, steady, and profitable. The survey that we've developed, again, that's linked to the, uh, via the web link at the bottom, is developed, uh, that we've developed is focused on the barriers and opportunities for producers in working with institutions, specifically addressing the type of resources and support they need to build successful business relationships. Not only will this help with the development of effective resources and support for producers, but we hope it will also help support state policy advocacy that will better support those who grow the food that we all depend on. The survey is live and active as of today and will be open through the end of the month. So we need as many producers that are out there uh, listening or producers that you might know to complete the survey so that we can get as much uh, data and information uh, to inform the work in the future years. So farmed institution, what are we talking about? What is it? Um, the answer is pretty straightforward. Farm to institution practices are broad initiatives that connect producers or farmers with nearby public institutions to provide fresh, healthy, and minimally processed food for their clients. Institutions come in all shapes and sizes with different needs, and you can see a list of some of the categories of institutions that you most likely find in communities throughout Minnesota. And you can see it ranges everything from K-12 schools all the way through to government offices and correctional facilities. Probably the most active sector within this farm to institution conversation is farm to school, but there's emerging work happening in farm to child care, as well as in farm to hospital, and the university and college movement to bring good food into their cafeterias. The common thread here is that institutions provide meals to a lot of people, and they serve a lot of food through that process. So why is this important? Why are we talking about this? Well, we can just look at some of the key points that come up when we talk about farm to institution. The fact that they feed a large and diverse number of people every day, there's significant income potential for producers that might be servicing this market. For example, there are approximately 1,300 schools in Minnesota that feed over 600,000 students on a yearly basis. This food costs around, they spent about $100 million in the 2011-2012 school year, 12 million of which was directed to local producers. In another example, there are over 130 hospitals in Minnesota that spend approximately $72 million each year feeding their patients. So these are just two examples of Minnesota institutions in their food buying power. We know that when institutions, in the food, when institutions purchase their food from their nearby producers, the local economy benefits. Research has shown that for every $1 invested through farm to school programs, there is a $2 economic stimulation that happens in the local economy. This means economic growth for small to medium scale producers, as well as their local communities. And there's great examples throughout Minnesota and the country that show us that healthy, the, that healthy relationships between producers and institutions can create new agriculture and food related jobs and businesses. Finally, we know that there are public, social and public health benefits to farm to institution markets as well. Institutions feed some of the most vulnerable people within the state and within the country be it little kids in their child care center or the elderly in their assisted living centers, farm institution practices ensure that healthy and nutritious food reaches those who need it most. It's not just healthy, it's also educational, creating greater awareness of and connection to Minnesota producers and the food that they grow, as well as changing individual eating, individual eating behaviors um, into the future. However, some of the previous surveys that we've done here at IETP and the work that other groups and organizations have done have shown us that there are challenges for growing the farm to institution movement and practices within Minnesota. And some of those we've listed here. You can see that there's challenges there aligning the seasonality of food um, with uh, the needs of different uh, institutions, uh, guaranteeing specific quantities, working with budgets, as well as matching up the scales of farms and logistics uh, with farms and institutions. This is not a comprehensive list by any means. It's just what some of our surveys have shown us. Um, however, these challenges are quite common throughout the state and country, and there's a lot more that, that needs to be worked on in order to move things forward. However, there are also real opportunities that could be used to address some of these challenges. And you can see a few on the left that we've identified through some of our surveys, and that has to do with expanding storage and value added operations to help better align producers and institutions looking at advanced planning between those two, the, the, the seller and the buyer, so to make sure that um, they have as much information and coordination as possible, looking at how to coordinate between institutions so that they can 
collectively uh, they can add their, their buying power and purchase more um, from the producers within their region. And also looking at opportunities uh, for producer cooperation and aggregation um, in order to match some of the logistics. Since these and other challenges and opportunities manifest in different ways in each region of the state, it's most important, the most important aspect of farm to institution is looking at the relationship between the producer and the institutional buyer and looking for tools and opportunities to create that relationship as smoothly and consistently as possible so that both sides are treated fairly and are able to um, achieve their outcomes. So to hear more, a little, a little bit more about the potential of institutions within Minnesota, we're going to hear now from Ryan Pesch. Ryan is an extension educator who works with communities and business organizations on the issue of economic development, tourism, and business development. He delivers programs and conducts research on these topics throughout West Central Minnesota. He lives in Lida Township in Ottertail County with his wife and three kids and operates Lida Farm, a diversified vegetable farm. So with that, I'll send it over to you, Ryan. Uh, okay, Pete. Uh, thanks much. Let me get this thing started here. All right. Um, so as as Pete introduced me, I'm uh, I am a, a vegetable operator, market gardener. Um, we've sold to some institutions, our local school district, um, as well as to a, a local food hub in uh, Fergus Falls, uh, as well as a, a couple of assisted living facilities. Um, but my role here today is uh, to speak. Uh, from the viewpoint of my day job and some of the work that we have done uh, in northern Minnesota assessing the size of the market of a farm to institution. I've done this work in northwest Minnesota initially and uh, we've recently just released a report uh, for central and northeast Minnesota as well, uh, kind of covering that full upper half of Minnesota. And I know Pete has a link on, on the IATP page on farm to institution, both of those reports if you want greater details. I'm just going to kind of give a bit of an overview um, of our process and, and some of our major findings that might be of interest to you as, as a grower. Uh, what we did in this project, I'm, uh, and this is this, I'm going to give you the results just from the North, what, Northwest example, um, just to illustrate some of the major findings, because the findings weren't significantly different between Northwest, Central, and Northeast. Uh, it's maybe different in different parts of the state. Uh, but maybe I, I would think would hold fairly well for greater Minnesota anyways. Um, and so what we had done is, uh, when I looked at previous research, uh, a lot of things, uh, a lot of times researchers, when they're trying to get a size of what's the size of the farm to institution market, farm to school market, uh, they said, hey, what's your food budget? And what percentage of that would you potentially source locally? And, and people would just take a basic calculation of, a food budget of half a million, maybe 5% local, that would add up to be X. Um, I, I thought it, it was necessary to kind of go a bit deeper. And so what we did is a product survey to get down to brass tacks, talking about what products uh, people were purchasing, which could be grown in the region in which they existed. So in or, you know, if we just look at a total food budget, uh, we're also including in there all the frozen pizzas and canned tomatoes and everything else. Instead, we really wanted to look at what fresh fruits and vegetables do you purchase on a weekly basis and what amount do you purchase on a weekly basis or monthly basis? What are the, the meats and grains that you, you purchase on a, a weekly and monthly basis? Um, and, and what are your total number of meals? So basically what we did with this is we, uh, we got a, a spending profile uh, based on our respondents, and we use that to extrapolate to the whole region to get a sense about, you know, um, what the whole market looks like, the size of the market, and what what types of foods they actually purchase and could purchase locally. Uh, so what we got is we got respondents from 43 um, K-12 school districts. We went directly to the food service directors. Uh, so this is 43 of the 54 school districts responded, um, and we heard from 67 percent of those. We heard from those that represent 67% of the meals uh, in that region, and uh, they serve 27,000 meals daily in the region. We also heard from 43 uh, healthcare respondents out of 129 that serve meals in the region, um, and so of a total of 13,000 meals that are served daily at healthcare facilities in the northwest region, uh, and that's from like Otter Tail North to Roseau, if you will. 
Um, and we heard from, uh, the people we heard from account for 72% of all the meals served throughout that region. So we feel it's a really good sample, really, really representative of the folks, uh, the food service directors, those serving meals at institutions in Northwest Minnesota. Uh, so what did we learn? Uh, one, uh, one thing that we, we learned was that uh, uh, getting to this product level, what, what actual products do people purchase? Again, here we're asking about fresh fruits and vegetables that can be raised in the region. That is, I'm not asking about mangoes or pineapples. I'm not asking about canned tomatoes, um, anything that has a lot of processing to it, just fresh product. Um, and, and so what we see here is pro probably what you, you would expect. Some of those products that uh, over on the right-hand side, those are the ones that are, are purchased by both healthcare facilities and school facilities. Lettuce, carrots, apples, tomatoes, broccoli, cucumbers are the ones that are quite high. I think one thing that's uh, my headline here is that, it, well, if we look at it uh, with the schools with the maroon bar and healthcare with the yellow, is that schools then quickly drop off in terms of the products that they purchase. Uh, we have, you know, some 70 some percent of schools purchasing cucumbers, but it drops off quite quickly if you look at some of the other um, less popular vegetables and products. Whereas healthcare actually purchases a wider mix of products. We see healthcare saying, yes, we do purchase, you know, um, 90 some percent are saying, yes, we are purchasing fresh potatoes a large percentage are purchasing cabbage. So there's a little bit of a difference uh, that we see between both schools and then healthcare facilities. And I should define that. In healthcare facilities, we, we really talk to nursing homes, assisted living uh, facilities, and, and hospitals. Uh, and of those that are currently not purchasing uh, from directly from producers, uh, there's still a high level of interest in doing so. So uh, on the right-hand side, we see healthcare's uh, health, the healthcare facilities interest in purchasing directly from a producer. Uh, that is, we didn't ask them if they were they're interested in purchasing locally, because sometimes that gets a little uh, um, it's a little hard to define sometimes what people mean by local. Uh, we did we asked them whether they were interested in purchasing directly from a farmer or producer, and we see that uh, 60 some percent are saying yes. Of those that are not currently purchasing. 67% are, are saying yes, and uh, more than three quarters of schools. And again, this wasn't too big a surprise because farm to school has been around much longer than farm to hospital, farm to nursing home, and things like that. Uh, we also saw uh, in, in this slide here, uh, we just show, um, again, the same purchases um, in the yellow bar uh, for all, all healthcare facilities. That is, what percentage or what number of them purchase potatoes, what number purchase lettuce, what number purchase tomatoes. And then in, in the maroon bar, this is their reporting of whether they have purchased it directly from a local producer or not. So as you can see, the difference between the yellow bar and the maroon bar is the disparity in the market. That is, uh, what it's saying here, if we look at healthcare, you know, some 80, some 90% are purchasing potatoes, but it's really only about, you know, 20% if you look at the maroon bar, that actually purchase potatoes directly from a producer. So we see some purchasing taking place. Although of all, uh, we asked them about their 2012 spending patterns, and throughout this entire region with all those meals, only $14,000 was reported that they spent um, uh, throughout the entire region uh, amongst all, uh, all those facilities. So there's certainly, that's a very modest number, and it goes to show both on this graph uh, as well as with that number, what, uh, how much more we have to go in order to fill uh, that uh, farm to institution market. Uh, what it comes down to is about 30% of all schools and healthcare facilities have purchased or have experienced purchasing directly from a producer. Uh, one other surprising thing uh, was that <clears throat> uh, this issue about, because what I'd always heard from producers is that, okay, that, that they may be a big market, but these institutional markets, or these, uh, they're very particular. Uh, they want things very processed, and it's difficult for us as producers who predominantly direct market in order to do some of that processing on, on site and to deal with some of the regulatory barriers of processing. What I was interested 
it's very interesting to find that um, especially healthcare wasn't as deterred um, by uh, Whole Foods. That is, uh, we asked them, what's your, pref what's your preference for lettuce? What's your preference for um, strawberries? And then would you accept that product in a whole form, an unprocessed form? And, and that's the results that you see here. So of those facilities that are purchasing that product, are, will they accept that product in a whole form? And as you see here, there's a number of products that uh, everybody, almost everybody's accepting in a whole form. Although something like you know winter squash, I don't know how you do it in any kind of processed form. I mean, winter squash is winter squash. Um, still, some things uh, they're surprising. You know, the, the the fruit or vegetable that's most sensitive, lettuce. Oftentimes, people are looking for shredded lettuce. You know, uh, we see that schools are quite sensitive uh, to taking lettuce in a whole form. But we look at again, healthcare not as sensitive. Uh, we see some 50% of healthcare facilities saying, "Yeah, I would take lettuce in a whole form." And uh, my my last note here, uh, looking at the big picture, when we added this all up, is that yes, um, from my own experience and from our experience doing this, is that. Uh, Farm to institution uh, can be big for any any given producer, but uh, but oftentimes um, more than likely what we're going to see are are some farms with one part of their business with farm to institution, maybe not even a large part of their business. Um, because right now, if we look at it, there's there's lots of different marketing channels that are open to us as producers. Uh, if we look here on the left from the USDA. USDA statistics, you know, schools and colleges add up to a total of 3% of uh, total food purchases by outlet. And um, our healthcare facilities actually fall into this others with uh, that also include uh, military installations. So, uh, you know, our way to, to begin filling this market is either have numerous farms uh, who take on farm to institutions as part of their marketing mix. It may be 5, 10% of what they do. Uh, and it fits in with their other markets, um, or there might need to be few farms really specializing in institution institutional sales. Because at this point, there really is a a long way to go from what people are currently purchasing and what people are able to purchase uh, throughout Minnesota. So with that, I turn it back to you, Pete. Okay, great. Well, thanks for that, Ryan. Um, really appreciate that larger perspective on the institution market. Um, just for those out there listening, um, in the chat box that is uh, in your webinar control panel, um, we've sent the links to Ryan's uh, the report that he and his team put together for Northwest and Northeast Minnesota. So um, feel free to check those out. You can also check them out on the Extension um, uh, website, um, the Community Economics as well as on the uh, link, the web link that's at the bottom of your screen now. Um, also, really quickly, before we move on to our next presenter, I um, wanted to make sure that you were sharing your questions via, for our Q&A via your control panel. So again, you can go through the control panel and add your questions in there, and we'll line them up um, so that at the back end of the webinar, we'll be able to put them out to our presenters and uh, have your questions answered. So uh, feel free to uh, start adding those in there. You don't have to wait till the end. Um, up next, we'll hear from Greg Reynolds um, on his experience as a producer selling to institutions. Greg and his wife own and operate Riverbend Farm, which is a certified organic operation. He's an active member of the Sustainable Farm Association, Association Farming Association, and uh, our beloved Gar Garlic Festival. He was a recipient of the Sustainable Farming Association's Distinguished Service Award in 2007 and the Wright County Farm Family of the Year in 2008. Um, so with that, uh, I'll pass it over to you, Greg, to share your experiences. Thanks. All right. Um, we'll get started with this. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, our farm is uh, a, a, the whole farm is about 80 acres. Uh, 10 or 12 acres are in vegetables any year. Uh, we are a small diversified vegetable farm. 
o'clock. Uh, we've been certified organic for 20 years. Uh, we're located about 30 miles west of the Twin Cities, so we have a, an access to a, access to a really big market, and, a, and actually a pretty vibrant market too. Um, so as you can see, we sell to a bunch of different places, uh, schools and and institutions, uh, retirement communities, and assisted living things are about 10% of our sale. And uh, been selling to schools for about uh, four or five years, and that came about through uh, an invitation to a renewing the countryside event, a uh, farmer chef networking event, uh, and it, and you know, it's led to a pretty, uh, pretty viable source of business for us. Um, so, in the we currently are selling to two two school districts and a uh, assisted living retirement community sort of facility. Uh, the the institutions, the schools, and the, the old folks home are treated like a restaurant for us. So we. Um, send them the same availability list that everybody else gets, um, and actually charge the same prices. We don't have a special price, you know, a lower price or, or a higher price for institutions. Uh, we deliver to each school kitchen, uh, which is a, a service that they really appreciate. They're, you know, it's possible for them to, to move things around within the district, but if it can go right to the school, the individual school, it's it's a, a very handy uh, service that, that they they use and uh, and we also in a sense sell to each school so uh, one school may only buy potatoes and one may buy potatoes and kale and carrots and uh, water squash they all have their own uh, personality in a way uh, things that we sell are um, the big ones are potatoes, uh, Roma-style tomatoes, cucumbers, winter squash, kale, carrots. Uh, for the and that those that goes to the schools for the uh, the other institution. It, it's it can be everything. Um, there are lots of slicing tomatoes and you know muskmelons and things like that. So some of the the problems that I've encountered is that. You know, the farming season really goes from June until the middle of October. The school sessions run from you know, the beginning of September till June. And so there's not a great overlap. Uh, and so, you know, for a lot of the school year, we're simply out of the market. We don't have, uh, we're not big enough to have a warehouse full of potatoes and winter squash uh, that we would sell all winter. The, the assisted living facility they do buy all season. They buy, you know, they start in June and they go right through to the end. Uh, an, an issue that they they see, but that really, you know, that it's hard for them to deal with is um, our price is a lot higher than what they're used to paying. They get uh, schools buy a lot of sort of fast food type commodity stuff, um, meat, grease, and stuff like that. It really give away prices. Uh, there are USDA surpluses, and uh, there is some complicated formula for how they get that. Uh, but it's a, it's, you know, really just about free. Um, the schools don't get very much to feed each student. They get, you know, a little over a dollar per student per meal, and that's uh, that's for the ingredients. You know, there's overhead and all this other stuff. But for the ingredients, it's only a buck, and if you go, you know, I mean, if you're going to eat lunch somewhere and you have a dollar to spend, you're not going to get very much. So they have, they're really cost conscious. Uh, the current the current um, schools facilities are a lot of them are, are basically eat and serve in this area. They've remodeled or built new schools and they don't have kitchens anymore. They're uh, you know joke about a bank of freezers and a bank of microwaves. And, and then the service line, uh, but it's it's hard for them. They can't. Well, they don't. They don't have a place to process raw foods, and they don't have anybody to do it. They don't have anybody with knife skills. Uh, and then the other thing is that that uh, we're an additional vendor, so they get most of their stuff from a broadline distributor that brings them uh, dry goods, produce, you know, paper, you name it. Uh, and now they have to deal with with us, which is a, a whole different system, uh, and it just a, a, it can be a bit of a hassle for them. 
some of the solutions for these things for the schools are um, food preservation, that they buy the Roma-type tomatoes when they're available in September. They roast them and uh, process them and freeze them as tomato sauce, and they pull the sauce out uh, out of the freezer all winter and use it on their in their menu as it comes up in the cycle. And that's been a really popular thing with the students. Yeah. Another thing is pickles. Uh, if you need to make refrigerator pickles, they store forever. Uh, same thing, kids love them. And then right now, uh, we are six weeks after our you know real basically killing frost. Um, so we're selling uh, potatoes, uh, winter squash. There is some kale that that are still that's still going. Uh, but we're going to be done pretty soon. And we're just going to run out of stuff. Uh, to get around the, the the price issue, the schools have been fairly creative uh, by offering little kids, kindergartners, first graders, a a portion of the protein they may have on half of a hamburger or something like that. And you know, the the little kids don't eat a whole one anyway. They throw part of it away. So if they're if they can eliminate that food waste, they're able to have more money to spend on uh, produce, and, and they do. The other thing that they do, schools do, is that they uh, offer special menus. There is a, uh, I forget what day of the week it is, but it's a, you know, a local food day, and they do it once a month. Once a month um, and that, that's popular with the kids. Uh, there's been even a, a GMO awareness day that, that's happened. And the other, the other part of it is that they have to be, you know, my customers have to be realistic and pay what it's worth. Uh, I can't, uh, I have to pay my, my crew something like a living wage, uh, you know, to then, so there's, a whole, there's a whole thing about that. And, and you know, one of the third thing is that uh, you really need to be uh, realistic about what is subsidized and what is recommended for the students. This is old, this is you know, just six, seven years old. But you can see in the on the left, um, subsidies, you know, it's dairy meat, uh, vegetables is that little tiny point right at the very top. Uh, and then their dietary recommendations uh, are just about inverted. So and, and I think now it's changed, there's more whole grains and things even in schools. So, so we have to be, as a society, we have to be more uh, realistic about what we're going to feed, feed our kids in school. Uh, there's a whole, you know, uh, certainly in the Twin Cities, there's a lot of kids that live in poverty, and their school lunch is the best meal that they get uh, practically, all, well, very probably all week. Uh, and that's, uh, that's an issue. Kids don't, don't learn well when they're hungry, they're distracted. Um, if they're if they're living on Cheetos and Mountain Dew, that doesn't work real well either. Uh, so that's attitudinal change. Um, for the, the the places that have or that are basically need to serve, I think the only option is to really sell upstream to the um, to the distributor. That there are um, distributors, uh, produce distributors in the cities that that process food. They cut, you know, wash, cut, bag. Uh, raw produce and sell it as a, as a semi-prepared product so they can buy uh, cubed winter squash in a bag and you know, you know, you just eat it up. Um, and the, you know, the thing with the additional vendors, it, the buyer has to be committed. They have to be, uh, they have to be willing to, to deal with the hassles and pay the extra price um, and see it as something that they're doing that's a benefit to their students or to their to their clients. It's not just a simple monetary exchange. So, and that's uh, that's all I've got. Okay, thanks for that, Greg. Um, appreciate it. Um, Experience and sharing some of the challenges and some of the hopefully uh, the good opportunities there for different institutions to build relationships with producers in their area. 
Um, before we move on to our final presenter, just wanted to again remind you um, to share your questions. We've had a steady stream of good ones coming through and I'm keeping track um, and we'll farm those out to our presenters um, uh, here in a little bit. So feel free through the control panel to add your questions uh, and we will make sure that we get you on the list. Um, so finally, we'll hear from Andrea Northup from the Minneapolis Public Schools. Andrea is the Farm to School Coordinator for MPS. Uh, and their culinary and nutrition services. Um, she helps make the crucial link between the farm and the cafeteria tray, doing a lot of really great work um, with a lot of the farms uh, surrounding the metro area. She's also actively engaged with farm to, in the National Farm to School Network and School Food Focus, which drive a lot of work both in the, up, uh, in the country as well as in the upper Midwest. Um, Andrea received the National, Re National Resources Defense Council's 2012 Growing Green award in the young food leader category, so it goes on that. Andrea, um, and that was specifically for um, some really great work done in the DC Farm to School Network. So we're very lucky to have her here to share um, the inst institutional perspective on buying food uh, regionally. So with that, I will pass it off to you, Andrea. Thank you. All right. And uh, I am not a farmer like my fellow presenters here, but I have much respect for them and other farmers in the state. So um, I'm proud to say that um, while I'm not a, buy a farmer, we do buy lots of food from them. So um, this slide here shows you a little bit about the scale of Minneapolis public schools. Um, we have almost 35,000 students, um, and we serve about 40,000 meals every day. So mostly lunches, but quite a few breakfasts as well. Um, at 61 schools across the city of Minneapolis. Like Greg said, most of our schools do not have kitchens, um, so we have to find quite a few workarounds to get local food into their cafeterias. Um, but we do have um, almost 50 salad bars at our school sites, too. Um, some of those sites without kitchens can still have salad bars, so um, that's one way we can get more fresh produce in there. Um, all right, so we have two categories, per se, of local food that we, um, that we consider. The first is what we call farm to school, and that is from some of the small sustainable growers in our region, pretty close into the Twin Cities, who we work with um, through contracts on specific produce items for the duration of the growing season and for as long as um, products can be stored. So um, these are small farmers, you know, typically I'd say five to 50 acres, um, who, um, who sell to us through, through these contracts and through certain special purchases. And it may be their first time selling to an institution or to a school. You know, they're typically farmers market growers or selling to the co-ops. Um, so we work particularly with them to build them up to the level of institutional sales. Local produce is when it's, um, it's from a grower who may already be working with our produce company or already working with our manufacturers to incorporate local products. Um, and there's you know, some of the larger growers in the area who are already familiar with institutional sales. Um, and then we also consider some of our local meats and bread products in this category too. So in order to um, work with these farm to school growers in particular, um, it takes a lot of communication. And um, through a partnership that we have with the University of Minnesota, we were able to hold a couple of workshops with these farmers and talk with them about what we're looking for and, um, and what they can provide. So this top, um, this top picture here is actually of a food safety workshop that we held with the University of Minnesota. And um, that's Annalisa there talking about on-farm food safety. We also gave the growers a tour of our nutrition center. Um, this top picture is of our farmers touring our produce company, um, where our produce is um, chopped and diced and packaged up, um, and then having lunch at a school. And during that workshop, we talked about product specifications and pack sizes that we needed. So, you know, all the potatoes have to be a certain size and packed in a 50-pound sack. 
Then we go out and do site visits, again with the University of Minnesota, um, to t go through a food safety checklist with our farmers and to get to know them and their growing practices. Um, so we go out to every site in, usually in the month of July, um, for that reason. Um, and then these are more site visits. Um, we'll, we check out their delivery vehicles. We make sure that um, you know boxes are stored properly off the ground, and and um, that there are hand washing facilities around. That that produce and I mean processes on the farm are tracked properly. Um, it's not a gap audit, but we have developed a more common sense checklist for food safety that we find has worked well with our farmers. This is an example of one of the tools we, um, we've created where um, for each product we buy from our farmers, we list a little bit more information about what we're looking for um, in terms of sizing, packing. We also are careful to communicate actually how this product is going to be used in the end so that farmers understand um, where their product is going to end up. And then the flow is, is as follows. Um, from the farm, some of our farmers use aggregators or, or shared delivery services, and then product is delivered to our produce company, Russ Davis. And then they either repackage or process that product for delivery to our nutrition center or our school sites. These are some pictures of some of our cafeteria trays and how local products are incorporated. Um, you know, they may be as part of a main dish, as a condiment or a side, um, on a salad bar, you know, within a salad. So those little carrot specks there are actually farm to school carrots in that salad. And, you know, this is to demonstrate that we have a lot of flexibility with where we can incorporate local items. And, you know, just because we're a large school district doesn't mean that we can use smaller quantities of farm to school items um, depending on how they're served. You know, if it's a, if it's a um, roasted side on just our high school menu, that's X number of pounds. If it's a um, component of a bean salad that's served at every site, you know, it's Y number of pounds. Um, I'm also, uh, we also have salad bars um, that we serve um, lots of fresh produce on. It's, it's a really great way to get um, sliced and diced produce in front of kids in an appealing way that they, that they love. This tray here is to show you some of the processes that um, come with incorporating local produce. For example, with that butternut squash there, that's a direct substitution. Using the same recipe, we can substitute our farm to school butternut squash for um, a conventional butternut squash product. The mashed potatoes, for example, though, um, had to be a whole other process for training our staff, creating a new recipe to go from powdered mashed potatoes which most schools use, to real mashed potatoes um, using a local product. Our turkey was a slight change, you know, with different cook times, um, but otherwise not a crazy different process in terms of a substitution. We haven't found good lettuce that works for us um, in terms of cost because we go through so much lettuce, um, but we're still working on that. Um, the apple, for example, when we do a farm to school apple, we don't slice it because a whole apple is cheaper for us from our processor than a sliced apple. Um, even though kids like it, we're able to provide, even though kids like the slices, we're able to provide a higher quality apple um, by not slicing it. And then the apple kale salad there was a, a totally new item. So that's a new recipe, new item, new process. Um, but worth it because that salad is just really awesome. Um, here are some of the farms we purchased from this year. Um, Gardens of Egan uh, grows for a lot of the co-ops and um, co-op partners in the area. And um, we talked with them about some of their products and particularly their seconds. So their cucumbers we bought from them are some of their larger or misshapen cucumbers that uh, otherwise wouldn't be able to work for a direct consumer market. 
Um, and there's our cucumber salad that we featured um, on our menus there um, down in the bottom left. Green peppers, same thing. Um, misshapen green peppers we can use in diced or sliced peppers. Um, so we took those as well. The Hmong American Farmers Association, um, a group of uh, about 40 Hmong farmers on about 150 acres in Hastings, Minnesota, gave us our um, roasted red potatoes. Well, they gave us to it. They gave them to us unroasted. We um, quartered or diced and roasted them, as well as some carrots. This is a um, the Tims are our are, are brothers down in Altura, Minnesota, and um, they're just taking over the farm there. They have about 30 acres from their parents and really are excited to grow more products for us. Um, they did our Yukon Gold Potatoes this year, which we used in delicious mashed potatoes. Our butternut squash, unfortunately, um, this, this is a picture from last year because uh, she got a freeze and wasn't able to sell to us. So that's another example where we contracted with her on butternut squash, but unfortunately weren't able to lost like 90% of her crop. We were expecting to buy, you know, about 5,000 pounds of, of butternuts from her. Ariel grew our cabbage and kale. Um, he's now certified organic on about five acres in Clear Lake, Wisconsin. There's the kale salad on a tray. And then we did a special trial run of delicata squash at our high schools this year um, from uh, Whetstone Farm. And then we also do some local meats, including the turkey from, from Fergal Market. So we found, um, uh, like Greg said, that, that celebrating farm to school and special days is really helpful for um, communicating to our staff and students about the fact that we're buying local food and um, expressing where it's coming from. So today, actually, November 6th, was Minnesota Thursday. So um, I was driving around to six or seven schools to see our Ferndale Turkey Sloppy Joe um, with glazed carrots from the Hmong American Farmers Association, um, apple cabbage slaw, and a whole apple. And we also have um, some fun educational events, again, to generate excitement, spread the word about um, Farm to School. This is our barbecue that we have every year in the parking lot of our nutrition center. And um, the most fun part of that being the corn shucking contest. And we do taste tests um, with about 30 of our elementary schools, which is about 15,000 samples every time we do them. Um, three times a year. So those are coming up. We have a next round of taste tests next week, which are designed to get kids excited about trying new things, um, thinking critically about their food, and uh, understanding where it comes from. And we enlist lots of partners for helping with our taste tests, like our, our chef council members and parents, volunteers, um, and then we have many, many partners who help out um, with various aspects of our Farm to School program. Um, and I will say that we are a large school district with lots of um, resources for firm to school, but um, you know a lot of the a lot of the partners are willing to help with small districts in in rural areas, and um, you know there are a lot of shared lessons to be learned from um, from our model, and 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 hopefully uh, other schools in your areas can avoid some of the mistakes we made and and use some of the tools and resources that we've created here in Minneapolis. All right. Well, thank you, Andrea, and also to Greg and Ryan for your presentations. Um, we do have some time here at the end to dig into a few questions. Um, so we'll unmute all of the presenters. And um, uh, we had quite a few here, so we probably won't get to all of them. But I will, uh, I'll throw out a few. Maybe we'll start with Ryan. Um, there was some question, uh, one of the questions that came up from a few folks was um, looking at um, if there's been any further research done on the market potential for uh, in public institutions for the whole of the state, specifically the South Central, the Southwestern, and the metro area. 
So Ryan, do you have more information on that? Um, to the best of my knowledge, no. Um, yeah, I've, I've done uh, three regions of the state and um, just doing those three kind of wore me out. So, I mean, <laughs> it's a possibility we could do the same method uh, in some other parts of the state. Um, uh, but we could, um, you could also, any, anybody could use some of the data that we've already collected um, and extrapolate it to their own region uh, to at least get some sense of um, about what the size of the market is in, in your region. Uh, but you don't need to get that specific. I mean, you can simply use some of the data that we have from our Depart Department of Health um, as well as the Department of Education to get a good sense about the number of meals in a region. Um, that's, it's like a big counting exercise. And, and uh, if you took our assumptions, you could roll with it. If, if anybody wants to dig into it more, they can certainly contact me. But, but at this point, I, I, I don't know of any plans to do the same process in other regions of the state. Great. Well, so it sounds like a good starting point will be to check out those existing reports for the Northeast and the Northwest, because um, those are quite comprehensive. Um, there was a question that came through for Greg. Um, there was uh, well, actually a couple questions that were asking about the best way that you found to approach a public or an institution to set up um, a purchasing agreement. So from your experience with the different institutions you work with, what have you found to be successful to start those relationships? Actually, the, um, and I, you know, this is a special case. I think that uh, um, the Farmer Chef networking events that are around, um, that the Renewing the Countryside has done several of those. I don't know if they do them all over the state, but they've certainly done several in the metro area around. Um, and the schools, come, you know, school districts come to those events, and they're very, you know, they're motivated. Uh, they're looking to buy local products. They're looking to meet local farmers. Uh, that works really well. And with other institutions, uh, it's cold calling, you know, good old fashioned sales work, or personal relationships. If you know the person that goes to run, manage the kitchen at a assisted living facility, uh, that's a great lead into. Great. Thanks for that, Greg. Um, for Andrea, there were quite a few questions that came through in your presentation. One of them that came out right at the right off the bat was um, looking at how to how to integrate farm to school or farm to institution work with some of the larger distributors. Um, we heard also from Greg that a lot of these institutions are serviced by quite large mainline distributors, um, and were people were curious about uh, what your experience has been balancing the local with the, the more national scale? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think I think the first step in doing that is um, asking asking distributors to, to, to disclose where their products are coming from. And I think some schools may be surprised to find that some of their local produce companies or broadline distributors are sourcing certain local products and just not making it aware or designating that on your, your pick list or your order guides. Um, you know, and, and have a conversation with them about what the process is for um, adding new products or switching a product to a local option. You know, hear from them what it takes behind the scenes for that to happen in their case and you know, what brainstorm together how you might do that. Great. Thanks for that. We'll try to tick through um, another question or two here. Um, uh, we'll move back up. Uh, Ryan, there's a question that came through um, that was looking at um, if you know of any programs that are out there to support um, the farm institution, specifically looking at how farms can, uh, smaller farms can best meet some of those institutional demands. Um, is that something that you'd be able to give us a little bit of insight on? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, when I think about my own region of the state here in western Minnesota, uh, and I think about existing resources, maybe getting back to uh, what Greg was talking about and, and kind of trying to make those initial con contacts, I think in my part of the state, you know, some of my colleagues that are in extension and in, uh, in family development that do a lot of nutrition work as well as uh, a lot of people that uh, from the statewide health improvement program, the SHIP program, 
are very much engaged um, with uh, local, uh, those local schools, uh, hearing from them about their demands for particular products and the like, and, and in my experience have been uh, great uh, connectors between uh, school districts and, and growers as well as trying to uh, kind of help growers figure out some of the things that they, they need to know in order to meet that market well. Uh, so I, I think as far as a people resource, at least in my part of the state, th those have been great people resources on the ground that know about, um, you know, uh, what needs to happen to make it work. Um, in terms of some other, maybe somebody's talking about kind of financial resources, one thing that certainly comes to my mind, um, and this is something in the, an investment that we've made on our own farm just recently, is uh, it, when we looked at the market, we, we, we did two scenarios, one for a standard growing season, which Greg rightly pointed out, kind of is starting to end at the same time schools are starting to ramp up. Um, we, we made investment recently into a root cellar, uh, and I know Greg was talking about his own s storage crop. I mean, I think one thing for growers to look at, uh, the Department of Ag, uh, I believe it's from ethanol funding, still has a, a fairly nice pot of money for uh, these value-added uh, producer grants, and some of those are, you know, something like a, a storage facility on farms so that you can sell in the off-season more easily. Uh, I, I think that would be something that would be um, look kindly upon in that in that uh, review process. So that that's definitely a financial resource to look at uh, that that's here throughout the state. Great, thanks for that, Ryan. Um, so there's a lot out there worth uh, digging into in terms of existing programs. Um, move on really quickly. Greg, there was a question that came through about um, what you've seen as far as uh, producers working together to establish um, the infrastructure or work with institutions to use their infrastructure to do some of the value add work that um, you mentioned as far as you know um, the pickling and whatnot. Um, have you seen that work successfully in particular instances? No, actually, it's the schools that are doing the in the sense the value added that they're they don't you know that they're. Um, their budgets are such that they couldn't afford to buy a processed product from us. Um, but the place where producers work together is uh, when a school needs, you know, several tons of tomatoes, uh, that can be hard to produce, and especially a year like this where everybody got a late start and tomatoes were pretty slow coming. Um, and then at the very end, there were, you know, there were a bunch of them. So it actually was uh, three farms that went together uh, to supply the tomatoes to the school that I sell to. And that, that worked out really well uh, because if, if you're farming, you know that you know, when the demand dries up, um, you're still left with a, with a ton of crop in the field you're stuck. So if several farms can work together, uh, they can all meet that need and, and not be you know, looking for an outlet for uh, two or three tons of tomatoes once the once the school's freezers are full. Great. Thanks, Frank. Thanks. Um, we'll try to get one last quick one in for you, Andrea, so you don't feel left out. Uh, there was a question that came through about, um, do you find that institutions, particularly schools, um, are preferring uh, that farms are GAP certified? Um, you know, I think it's a mix. Um, we've you know, we've gone the route of partnering with our produce company not to require GAP certification. Um, if a farm is GAP certified, they can sort of sidestep the alternate food safety certification that we've sort of created here. Um, but I think, I think GAP is just outside of having the resources to go to every farm and learn about their food safety practices. It's the only thing we have in place right now that's a certification that can, you know, allow schools to rest assured that their product is is safe and sound. So, um, at the, you know, it, it, it's a mixed bag. <laughs> Well, thank you all for fielding those questions. I'm glad we were able to get through so many. And we are just almost at the stroke of four, so I want to wrap up in respect for everyone's time. Um, so also thank you to everyone who participated in the webinar listening in. Um, 
hopefully it was a helpful and useful experience for you. Um, again, we really want to encourage any producers that are on the call or on the webinar or any that you might be connected to, to go to the link that's showing up on the screen right now, www.iatp.org forward slash FTI, for Farm to Institution, uh, and complete the survey. It'll take between 15 to 30 minutes, and the feedback there really does address some of these key challenges and opportunities, as well as some of the resources and reports that producers think uh, would be helpful to help them make these connections. So that survey is open until the end of the month, and we need as many people filling it out as possible. So uh, that's a good next step for those that are interested. Um, other than that, again, thank you all. Uh, it's been a great webinar, and we appreciate uh, you tuning in. So we will speak to you again soon.